Good afternoon and welcome to one of our webinars. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you. Good morning, wherever you may be, and good evening uh, if you're in some other place around the world. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at setting up a clinical lab. Uh, specific, uh, specifically, we're going to be interested in the whole PCR setup. And joining me with me, uh, joining with me today is uh, Professor Dennis Bayrugaba, uh, who is Professor of Microbiology out of the University, Makerere University. Hi, Prof. Could you please say a word to our guests who are joining us today? Uh, you're, you're still muted. Hi, Kilian. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, my name is uh, Dennis Biarugawa. I'm a professor of microbiology at Makerere University. I've been working at Makerere for the last um, over 27 years, uh, teaching microbiology to undergraduate students and supporting uh, supervision of graduate students. Uh, but most interesting for me, uh, engagement in research, particularly with the current or similar to the current threats of the coronaviruses. I've been working with coronaviruses in humans, looking at the traditional seasonal influenza, I mean, uh, coronaviruses, uh, in addition to other respiratory viruses. But we have also looked at corona in other animals, including bats in Uganda and Rwanda. We have also looked at uh, coronaviruses in camels, particularly evidence for the mass coronavirus in camels which probably most of you understand as the major reservoir for mass coronavirus. So it's a pleasure for me to be here and uh, discuss with you the challenges and opportunities of uh, engaging in laboratory diagnostics for coronaviruses. Over to you, Kirian. Thank you so very much indeed, Dennis. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us today as uh, we continue to look at testing going on around coronavirus, uh, the, the very interesting things happening in the laboratory space. And that's why we want to have this discussion today. And uh, just to be able to start off, uh, uh, there are a few things that we're going to look at uh, here today. Again, as I said, uh, we're looking at the International Organization for Standardization uh, Standard uh, 15189, which deals with laboratory medicine. I'm going to talk, uh, take you through a few key requirements on the technical side. Uh, specifically uh, personnel, the environment in which the work needs to be done in, and then issues around uh, the quality of testing. Uh, so, and then uh, Dennis will take us through the uh, PCR uh, reaction. So just to be able to uh, piggyback on something we've said in the past, uh, is to talk about the history of the ISO bodies. The International Organization for Standardization has been around for 74 years. And it's really important the work that they do uh, when we're looking at standards such as the ISO 5189 for medical laboratories. Uh, it's nice to know that the ISO uh, group of bodies have a very huge history uh, behind them. And that's the basis for which a lot of the uh, standards that we use today is actually based on. So going back to uh, ISO 5189 and the current version that we have today is the uh, 2012 version. That's the third version of this particular standard. The first one was the 2003 version. And then after the 2003 version, we had the 2007 version. And now we are the 2012 version of that standard. I threw in this slide because this is a very important slide for most people who understand uh, the standards and people who have had to interface with uh, the ISO uh, 9001. The ISO 9001 basically speaks to uh, quality management systems. And the ISO 15189 is a high level standard uh, that is actually built on the ISO 9001. And when we look at 9001, we really look at something that has come to become very familiar today, which is called the PDCA cycle. Uh, the PDCA cycle basically stands for plan, do, act, and adjust. We prefer to say adjust as opposed to, uh, to act at the foundation. And I really throw this slide in here because it's a very important slide. When we look at the lower part of the curve, uh, at this uh, slide, down here, when we're talking about inputs, these are inputs from all the clients 
uh, the ISO 9000 and one will call them interested parties. But for those of us in clinical laboratory, clinical medicine, uh, once you get an input, that input has to go through some very important processes that those are processes of the pre-examination phase, uh, the examination phase, and then the post-examination phase. And then that will lead you to results which will in then go on to satisfy the customer. And it's this phase that uh, Dennis is going to be uh, addressing when he comes up to speak. I would generally be talking about some of the other elements that support the technical phase of uh, us being able to set up a clinical laboratory. So the very first thing that I want to look at is uh, 5.1 out of the ISO 5189, which, is, which deals with personnel. Personnel is a very key thing. Uh, understanding the fact that they need to have job descriptions, understanding the fact that they need to be trained, they need to be competent for the environment in which they are going to work in. It's very easy for us to have a PhD uh, graduate and with so much knowledge on what they know, but they need to be trained to the environment in which they are going to work in. So there, there needs to be an orientation that welcomes everybody into the different management systems that they are going to work in. Then there is, of course, continuing education, professional development. Uh, the world is changing today at such a very humongous speed and pace that we need to continuously stay current with the things that are going on in the job. So when we look at uh, personnel and we look at the section of the standard that addresses that, um, I just want to bring your attention to the use of the word shall in this standard, which means you must have a documented procedure that talks about how you are going to manage personnel, but also that indicates that there is compliance to your system. Because one of the big things around standards is ensuring the fact that each activity can be repeated in exactly the same way. And that's the crux about standards, is ensuring that activities within any organization and within any system can continuously be repeated without any errors. So when we look at personnel, there are issues of personnel qualifications. Those qualifications have to be documented. So each system has to document what are the qualifications that will be required for them to accept anybody to work within the systems so that we can ensure that if you've got those qualifications, and qualification in this case does not actually only mean an academic uh, degree or certification, it could actually also be time spent because the standard talks about education, it talks about training, but it also looks at your experience because you could have a certificate uh, level graduate, however you've been in the lab for the last 15 years, that's experience that allows you to be able to do some of the complex testing uh, like the polymerase chain reaction testing that we're going to be talking about. But also there has to be a demonstrated skill that you can show. In job descriptions, it says there must be a job descriptions because one of the big things that job description does is it creates boundaries. And that's the big crux about standards. When you look at the high level standards, uh, 21 of them, the very first thing that they talk about is what is the scope? Basically they're saying, what is the boundary? That's exactly what the scope is. So job descriptions actually tell you what are your boundaries of work. Uh, personnel introduction to the organization. Personnel need to know. There needs to be a program that the personnel are going to go through to be introduced to the organization and to their workspace. And then there is the training that is required for them to be in that space. That is very important training. I spent a lot of time looking at uh, competency because competency is a very fundamental part to standardization. If you're gonna have uh, standards uh, within organizations and especially within clinical medicine, diagnostic medicine, public health medicine, there needs to be a certain minimum level of uh, competence that is going to be required. And how do you actually ascertain that this competence exists? The standard requires that you should use a combination of uh, a couple of methods that it says is, it could either be direct observation, um, of routine work, it could be direct observation of how you manipulate the equipment, it could be monitoring of how the records are maintained, or it could be review of records that the staff keep, as well as assessments of problem solving, how does the employee assess a problem and how do they resolve that problem. Something as simple as uh, there's a request for a test to be done on a patient and either the, the clinician requesting forgot to put the date of birth and decided to put an age, that's a problem. And that's a problem that has significant uh, impact on results. Because uh, if you said that the patient 
uh, was 15 years old when they actually were 13 years, that could be a huge difference in their result range. And then examination of uh, specially provided samples. Uh, this is, for example, uh, external quality assurance samples, uh, seeing how the staff actually manages. Looking at any of these and looking at any of the six elements and ensuring that you use them in a combination allows you to be able to justify the staff as being competent, competent to do the work that they need to do. Then there is reviews of uh, staff performance. Uh, now you've, you've deemed them competent to be in your space and to do the work that they do. And then we now need to do a review of their competencies. And this is extremely difficult. It is very far removed from the traditional did you come to work? Uh, are you a polite staff? No, this is competencies with regards to how do you do laboratory work? Are, are you doing your internal controls the way they're supposed to be done? Do you send out patient results with internal controls run that have actually passed? Uh, continuing education and professional development. Uh, I cannot overstate this, but in today's age, if you go to sleep, and you sleep too long, when you get up, the whole world would have moved away from you. And in light of that, we all have to keep looking out for what's the new paper that has been written, what's the new research that is going on, what's the new, uh, breaking news around the things that are happening in the scientific world. But the organization has to ensure that uh, continuing education and professional development is available to its staff and that they have to take uh, advantage of it but it has to be reviewed periodically to ensure that the services that are offered in this vein are actually what is required by the staff. Then when we look at personnel records, there are 11 requirements in that area uh, that need to be met just to ensure that the staff are up to date with something as simple as ensuring the fact that uh, the uh, occupational health standards have actually been met uh, to ensuring that the right uh, uh, vaccinations are in their records, their addresses are current, uh, things that are really simple, but these are very important things. Should there be an unfortunate uh, circumstance that happens at work? The next area I want to look at is the area of accommodation and environmental conditions. What's the environment in which this clinical work is going to be done? Uh, lots of times uh, we go to hospitals and lots of times we see people, those of us who are in the clinical space, uh, lots of people don't know that there is a laboratory uh, in a lot of these facilities. And most of them who know, they don't actually know what happens post the collection of a blood sample, a urine sample, a stool sample, or some other uh, body part. They really don't know what happens behind that. But the environment needs to be very adapt uh, to ensure that the testing is done in the right way, that there are storage facilities to be able to store the, the samples, uh, pre-testing and post-testing, uh, that staff facilities are available for staff to be able to uh, relax after spending many hours at work. But also most importantly, to ensure that the uh, patient samples, there is a specific place for collection, which actually increases the level of confidentiality and also increases comfort for the patient ensuring that there's a separate place for them to be able to uh, collect their samples. And then of course, there is the laboratory and office space facility. There needs to be a distinction between an area where work is actually being done from in terms of clinical work, technical work, which will involve in some cases fumes and in some cases just uh, dangerous uh, microorganisms that needs to be separated from office space where a lot of paperwork is done uh, phone calls are answered for more visitors are being seen. That is really, then looking at laboratory uh, and office space, the standard is very clear. It says the shall, the organization shall provide an environment, which means there must be one that actually clearly delineates what is office space from what is laboratory space. A storage space and conditions shall be provided, as I said earlier on, to ensure that the spacement Whatever that specimen is, as I said earlier on, it could be stool, it could be urine, it could be blood. In some cases, it could even be a body part uh, for forensic studies, that that specimen continues to maintain integrity for the testing that is going to go through. Staff facility. Of course, uh, we have staff people working in these uh, laboratories, in this clinical space. 
there needs to be adequate washrooms. There needs to be space for them to be able to change from their street clothes into uh, work clothes in the case of the lab. Uh, they need to change into uh, aprons and those kinds of things. There needs to be space for them to do that. A uh, place for them to sit down and have a, a, a good hot coffee or something of that nature. Uh, patient sample collection, as I said earlier on, the standard is very clear that there shall be a separate reception and waiting area for specimen collection. This again just ensures the fact that the patient can enjoy the confidentiality in a time when they need uh, the most uh, amount of care possible. And it also addresses the issue of first aid in that uh, environment. Uh, one of the last points when it comes to the environment is actually ensuring facility maintenance. Uh, facility maintenance is just as important as everything else that goes on in the uh, laboratory space. Uh, premises has to be maintained in a functional and reliable condition. Uh, if you want your doors to open, the doors should open. If windows are supposed to be open to allow for good flow of air, if you're working with uh, TB, yes, the windows should be able to open, they should be able to close. Uh, the la laboratory should be able to mon uh, monitor and control the whole environment. Uh, basically, what are we talking about? We're looking at noise levels, for example. We're looking at uh, temperature levels. We're looking at humidity levels to ensure that the equipment uh, function the way they're supposed to function. But also, because of the different pathogens or the different uh, specimens that we are going to be working with, or even what is going on in the lab, the lab might actually be preparing its own media for testing. Uh, if you're talking about uh, a wet lab uh, research place, for example, where they're actually creating vaccines. There needs to be a very clear separation between space. And uh, Dennis is going to be talking about this when he goes into make his presentation. And the last, uh, there are actually 10 pieces of uh, 10 clauses to the technical requirements uh, and the ISO 15189. But I just want to speak to these three because they are actually paramount as we look at what is going on today in the COVID-19 testing area. There is the issue of uh, ensuring quality of examination results. When we talk about ensuring quality of examination results, this is a very challenging area today uh, when we do COVID-19 testing. Because uh, you may know that a lot of the tests that are out there, almost 735 test kits are out there, whether it's a uh, serological testing or it's a, uh, 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 serological testing or it's the PCR testing. One of the things that we know is that right now, all of these tests are actually based on emergency use authorization. Basically emergency use authorization, commonly known as EUA, is a result of the fact that there is not enough data and there is not enough information for us to be able to distinctly say that whatever the result is that we've gotten actually is that result. Uh, Dennis might say a word or two about sensitivity and specificity of the test kits that are out there and what happens in that area. Uh, that's a very important thing to look at. And so how do we look at this and how do we ensure that this happens where we are today? Uh, that's, we'll be looking at things, ensuring the quality of examination results. For you to be able to ensure the quality of examination results, some really basic things have to happen. Quality control data is necessary. Interlaboratory comparisons have to be done. Um, sample exchange between laboratories, evaluation of laboratory performance, and comparability of examination results. These are some of the things that need to be done when we're thinking about uh, ensuring the quality of examination uh, reports. So if we looked at quality control, the standard again is very clear. It says, shall be designed so that the quality control procedures that verify the attainment of the intended quality of the result. For you to look at that and ensure that the intended quality is attained, there needs to be control material. Quality control material needs to exist. And quality control material has to exactly mimic the specimen that you're going to use. So if you're going to use blood, your quality control material should have the same features as blood, human blood, by the way. Uh, quality control data. Uh, quality control data, ensuring that you have enough data points to be able to make reference to. And then we talk about interlaboratory uh, comparison. This is more than one, two laboratories uh, exchanging participation. Uh, there might be alternative approaches if the are running a test that is not actually approved or known or common. Uh, there might be alternative approaches that they have to be able to show 
that because we are doing a test which does not have uh, uh, quality controls or external quality assurance material available, this is what they're doing to ensure that the quality of the examination results are still as reliable as they're supposed to be. Analysis of interlaboratory comparison samples, uh, that's important to do because it does the same thing, evaluation of laboratory performance. How has your laboratory been doing over the last seasons? And uh, one of the other things here is comparability of examination results. Comparability of examination results is not just about the value. Uh, because I ran a test in my laboratory and the quantitative result was 5.2 and you repeated the same sample in your laboratory and the quantitative result is 5.3. That's not what we're talking about. There, there, we need to be able to look into this. There needs to be criteria that is first of all set so that we appreciate the standard deviations of where our results are going to fall in before we can actually get into the comparability of examination results. Because within those standard deviations, we're going to be able to say for certain that the results that you get out of my lab and the result that you get out of Dennis's lab, for example, actually are meaningful, whether it's 5.2 or 5.3. That would be the only way that you can ensure the comparability of those examination results. So in a nutshell, uh, I just wanted to make a presentation on three of the 10 elements in the technical requirements of the standard uh, that we need to think about. We need to think about our personnel. We need to think about their competencies, their readiness to come onto the job. We need to think about the environment in which the work is going to be done. Uh, today, we're talking about COVID-19. Uh, it needs special uh, biosafety cabinets to be able to operate in. That's the environment in which COVID-19 is going to be tested. And then we need to think about uh, the quality of the results that are going to come out and the workplace in which we're doing it and what are the competing uh, materials that we're using to ensure the integrity of the results. So with that very little presentation uh, into setting up uh, the clinical lab in preparation to doing the polymerase chain reaction, at this point, let me invite Dennis to take us through the really three simple steps as I showed you earlier. What happens at pre-examination, what happens at examination, and what happens at post-examination? David, uh, Dennis, please welcome. Uh, th thank you, Kilian. Um, if you can allow me to share the slides, please. Okay. Uh, please, if you would just turn on your video as you come on. Yes, I will. Thank you. Uh, just give me a minute, I uh, find the file. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to um, share with you some thoughts about setting up uh, PCR laboratories for COVID testing. And uh, I'll take you through uh, some steps and uh, also share with you some of the current testing capabilities and platforms uh, so that you, uh, in case you are in your early stages of setting up, um, setting up COVID testing laboratories, then uh, you can begin these discussions and we'll be happy to follow up if you have any further discussions. So just as a background, um, you are all familiar with what clinical laboratories are, where they are offering a different range of laboratory procedures. Uh, 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 
to aid basically physicians in aging mental patients. And these might come in different ranges, but we'll be focusing particularly on the molecular biology testing, which encompasses the PCR tests that are being currently run to inform uh, treatment and management of COVID patients. But otherwise, uh, there are kind, different kinds of um, sections that you might find in a clinical lab, including clinical chemistry, clinical microbiology, hematology, blood banking and serology, histopathology, and uh, molecular biology or public health. You may realize that uh, even within COVID, besides uh, virus detection, uh, you may find yourself engaging in other uh, sections of the lab uh, in order to give a more comprehensive evaluation of patients, either by doing uh, other clinical chemistries or histopathology or other areas that might be required uh, to support the management of these patients. But for today, we'll be focusing on PCR labs and um, how these are set up and how they are managed. Um, now, PCR labs are mainly designed with the backdrop of avoiding contamination, which is the most critical component when you're setting up uh, PCR facilities, as well as, of course, you don't forget about the considerations for the biosafety. But primarily, you are looking at avoiding contamination, both in processing, but also in the personnel that are working with the PCR samples. And to avoid contamination, you want to ensure that you avoid introduction of unwanted nucleic acids because of the high sensitivity of the PCR technique. When you repeatedly amplify segments of a target, uh, you may duplicate small quantities or very high levels, and you end up with a very long detection. And this is why we want to avoid any kind of contamination to ensure that we are specifically amplified that specific target and not any either out of contamination or because of the special areas of sources of contamination and these you need on how you set your PCR uh, processing specimens. This could happen at the point of sample reception or during processing of samples uh, in the safety hood if you're managing different samples and you're not taking care to ensure that you avoid contamination. Um, they could also arise from ampli amplification product contamination at the time when you are doing the amplification, or they could arise from laboratory surfaces or ventilation ducts, or sometimes they may arise from supplies or reagents if uh, for any reason these were contaminated during the process of their mixing. Also arise from uh, the personnel from their liver or any other processes uh, or materials that could be there. You need to ensure that you can minimize uh, these contaminations when setting up a molecular laboratory. As I mentioned, in order to avoid contaminations, these are normally largely uh, avoided through mechanical barriers to prevent uh, these contaminations, either by doing partitions in form of solid walls or partitioning the labs with the other modifications of uh, but uh, modifications or partitions that will prevent any potential uh, crossover of uh, potential uh, areas. Now, as a standard, we normally prescribe at least three separate areas, and these include the reagent preparation, uh, where you do not want by any chance to have any of your reagents uh, contaminated because it will result in two uh, product loss or resources that will be lost because the whole batch of those reagents, suddenly if they are contaminated, then you are going to lose these. We also uh, recommend a separate area for specimen uh, preparation uh, where you precisely um, receive the samples, you process them, and uh, you do your um, 
uh, extraction where necessary or where you are having uh, separate uh, or combined processes for extraction, then we also see the kind of setup that you might have as perhaps some of you might be aware. And the area number three is normally where you do your amplification. And this could be uh, combined with product, product detection or sometimes if you have uh, additional uh, preparations like for plasmids, then this is where you'd be manipulating your products and uh, you need to ensure that this area is decontaminated regularly because this could serve as a potential uh, source of uh, contamination. And it is very important that these areas are physically separated and preferably at a substantial uh, distance uh, from each other. Should that not be the case, then of course you need to be a little bit careful uh, how you move from these areas. And we normally recommend what we call a unidirectional flow, where you start from movements from the dirty areas moving towards the clean areas. Uh, this uh, should be the case for both personnel, including uh, personnel as well as movement of specimens. And then uh, you have uh, amplification product free to product rich and uh, removing PPE before leaving one area to the other. We always also recommend that to avoid any potential crisscrossing, uh, that you dedicate specific uh, laboratory protective gear for each of the rooms. So that if you have colleagues, then they come from a clean area with a dedicated in area. But that also serves as a reminder if you have different colors that can help you to. Um, remind you on which area you're working so that you can be a little bit more careful. Um, I uh, picked this um, uh, simple unidirectional workflow uh, from And this uh, gives you uh, the basic three areas we have talked about the reagent preparation area, the sample, different laboratories will have different setups, uh, but what is but uh, controlling the movements of uh, materials from different areas. So the specific features of the equipment, including uh, they should have specific pipettes, laboratory coats, cleaning materials, as well as any other supplies like printers or ventilation when required. The reason this is very critical is that um, this encourages staff not or personnel not to move from one area to the other, picking up materials from different areas. So for example, you must have um, freezers or refrigerators for your reagents in the reagent room and have separate freezers or refrigerators uh, in the specimen uh, handling area so that you're moving, not moving these, including pipettes, so that you do not encourage any potential um, area for a main room for risk contamination. Uh, in addition, you will probably have different um, air pressure that may be required depending on the kind of pathogen that you're dealing with. If you're dealing with high pathogens, then you might need uh, negative pressure in the sample preparation room where normally you're manipulating these pathogens and you want to ensure that they are inactivated before they move into the rest of the areas. Um, and the reagent prep should have a single entrance uh, where reagents are used for amplification should not be exposed to any of the other areas because as I mentioned, this is uh, where you have your clean materials and any contamination of these materials is going to lay waste to uh, these potential materials that would not be used any further in the process. Um, 
this is uh, an additional example of another uh, design where you can have you have your sample preparation room again of your reagent uh, preparation room as well as if you're doing for example a general chocolate different setups again basing on your resources if you're setting up or building a new structure that becomes easy because then you can uh, be able to plan your facility but if you're working with an already existing facility then you need you may just be doing renovations and therefore you have to look up for how you can physically separate these different areas and encourage um, movement that are not going to potentially uh, contaminate the other areas. Um, sometimes you may be faced with uh, different scenarios where you do not have sufficient room to physically separate um, the different workstations you may also be using uh, platforms that may not uh, necessarily require physical separation but you could potentially be able to work safely without contamination in one room for example and this has been um, quite very well utilized in some of the platforms like gene expert where you load your um, samples within uh, the biosafety cabinet and then you transfer uh, safely your loaded cartridges into the gene expert and um, uh, that way you you have the whole amplification and um, detection of the final result within one workstation and therefore you will not need to um, uh, to have separate rooms but your practices during this process how you uh, get your cartridges and how you mix them up with your samples is very very critical to ensure that uh, you minimize potential um, potential contamination and particularly in in cases that uh, you have a serious and widespread pandemics like we have for covid uh, you may be required to have these kinds of stations where you can manage within the resources and within the infrastructure that is available to you but uh, having at the back of your mind that you are able to um, potentially eliminate all kinds of contamination by your physical practices but also utilizing the resources and platforms that can avoid any potential or, or, or compromise of your materials um, now you may have other laboratory design considerations uh, that may be required for example temperature and humidity requirements uh, exhaust ventilation again depending on the kind of pathogen and also requirements for your safety requirements uh, you may you have to put consideration for your water quality, your electric outlets, depending on the equipment that you have, as well as uh, power backup. In our settings where you may have unreliable power systems, uh, power backup is runs in the middle when power goes off, and therefore you must have uh, investments into power backup systems. Uh, and of course, uh, eye washes and other ergonometric assessments that make your workflow much, much um, comfortable. Now, I mentioned uh, laboratory practices. Uh, it does not matter how beautiful spaces are very well managed, so that uh, even if you have physical spaces, this can be compromised if your laboratory personnel are not practicing what is required of them. And so use of positive displacement pipettes, avoiding production of aerosols when pipetting, use of sterilized single-use plastic wear, use of clean room stickers, uh, sticky floor mats, as well as minimizing risk of amplicon ampli carryover on clothing, uh, such as uh, by having hair nets or dedicated safety glasses, as well as gloves and shoe covers so that as you move from one room to the other you're not carrying out uh, you're not carrying with you any amplicons into the other separate rooms um pcr can be very beautiful but the moment you start getting contaminations then becomes quite quite challenging uh, in addition, samples, uh, use of nuclear-free, uh, nuclear-free, are uh, quoted 
and are frozen separately so that should there be a contamination in one batch, then you have uh, a fallback position on your aliquots. And always uh, it is important in your assays to always include um, a control as a blank to check your contamination, uh, as well as other uh, practices that you need to ensure that, uh, as I mentioned, you minimize contamination as much as possible. There are standard decontamination approaches. Uh, even when you have followed all the practices, you have separated the rooms, you need to ensure that you decontaminate um, gradually by using uh, uh, cleaning of the, uh, of the surfaces. You clean the PCR workstations at the start and the end of the workday using UV light or 70% ethanol or fresh uh, sodium hypochlorite. Or if you have access to DNA away, then that can be used as well to ensure that your workstations are clean. There is no shortcut about cleaning of uh, PCR workstations because if you do allow any room, then you are going to face very serious um, potential for contamination. You clean the exterior and interior parts of the pipettes, clean the equipment, and make sure that periodically all the NOAA knobs and handles of freezers uh, have been decontaminated so that you minimize as much as possible uh, contamination. You almost need also to look at your chemical and enzymatic controls uh, because you have quite a number of enzymes that you use in your, um, in your processing for PCR. And so this is very, very critical that you avoid any chemical or enzymatic uh, contaminations. And you do this by uh, cleaning all your workstations by sodium hypochlorite, which normally helps to remove um, uh, any particles for DNA. The UV um, light also helps to degrade uh, the potential contaminations of uh, nucleic acid. And uh, you will also need to do enzymatic inactivation, normally using uracil uh, glycosylase, uh, which helps to, again, further degrade any potential contaminations that could have spilled over into your work areas. Now, uh, it's also critical, uh, as uh, Kian mentioned, that as part of your quality management systems, that all the batches of your reagents, all any materials that you um, bring into the process, testing process have been validated or verified, uh, particularly when you introduce a new test, uh, all in new analytes, all there is a modification of the test system. And this applies including to the FDA or EU applied, I mean, approved uh, standards, particularly when you are introducing them into new areas, uh, you do not take things for granted. And therefore you may always want to run these and verify them uh, against known um, standards or against previous procedures that you have been using so that you are sure that these are working and they are working properly. Um, and you must have a quality control plan to ensure that you have all the necessary uh, required types of control, including positive and negative controls, as well as um, evaluations of controls and calibrations of all the equipment that you use in your process. And uh, part of these include, as I mentioned, internal controls. Uh, for example, internal positive amplification controls to detect failure of DNA extraction would be related to the reagents or integrity of the DNA sample or the presence of inhibitory circumstances, I mean substances. You also need external quality control uh, controls, including the positive control, negative control, as well as no template control and blanks in your tests to ensure that what you get is precisely due to what you are looking at for. Uh, external controls may be related to um, uh, ensuring that you do not have inhibitors. There are no component failures. All these are not related to interpretation of results. And um, uh, you need to uh, make sure that there's no nucleic acid contamination during extraction or during the PCR processing. And all these controls help you to, to do that. 
Now, these um, quality uh, measures, uh, how to be controlled again, you cannot probably be doing this every other uh, time, uh, but you must include uh, some of these controls in each one that you do, particularly for the positive and negative controls, as well as the blanks. Some of the other uh, uh, controls might be done on different batches of reagents. Ten one point, you're using clean and um, validated or verified reagents, and your equipment is working uh, very well. It has been validated regularly, and you have no reason, uh, if whatever result you get, uh, to have any doubt of what uh, went wrong. Now, specifically to COVID testing, uh, you will realize those of you who are into this field that there have been a couple of uh, issues arising of uh, or out of discrepancies between uh, tests. Uh, uh, and before you um, examine those tests and their val validity of the results, you just need to look at the basics. What is this COVID disease? How does it, um, how does it progress over time? And what tests are you going to include at different stages? So we know by now that uh, we have a quite significant time that, um, where there are no clinical symptoms, age where there is development of symptoms, but also the covalence and uh, phase. Different uh, tests are not going to be applicable to all these different stages because, for example, uh, when you have a symptomatic stage or the virus is still intubating, First of all, you have minimal antibodies during that phase because the virus is just uh, inducing the immune system to um, respond. Still multiplying, and therefore you might have in the late stages. That's when you have antibody and antibody tests might be up, be able to apply the right test at the right point, and also interpret it. So if you you might want to uh, apply at different um, stages, it's, or you may want to do um, uh, antibody tests. You may have had quite a number of significant proportions of samples that sometimes turn out as false negative. And these normally might be a result of testing in the early phases of the disease when there isn't sufficient virus that is circulating, but still uh, growing and the numbers of viral particles are still very, very minimal. And there you're likely to have a very significant proportion of false negatives. Right now, we know that there are quite a number of people that have a very, very small, I mean, that have uh, a symptomatic uh, um, showing a symptomatic um, uh, picture and because they do not have a high viral load. And when you don't have a high viral load, it means your ability to detect the nucleic acid or the viral particles are going to be minimal. But as the virus uh, replicates and you have many uh, viral particles and therefore you have a higher viral load, then you have a most efficient detection using your nucleic acid detection kits. Um, and in the later stages, when the body has uh, reacted and produced antibodies or some other immune responses, then you're comfortable using uh, serological diagnostic tests. So the interpretation of these results are very, very critical, um, basing on the, your understanding of the disease and also the expectation uh, from whichever samples you have received and at what stage these samples were taken. Now, uh, most of these uh, tests are based on the genome. As we mentioned, with regard to PCR, you're basically detecting a specific target on the genome of the uh, SARS virus. And down here on, the, on the, um, the left, you have this the typical structure of the coronaviruses with uh, the uh, typical surface proteins which are normally uh, detected or which um, are very good for detection of these viruses. And therefore you have the nucleoprotein, you have the matrix protein, you have the spike protein, 
and all these have been used in the detection of um, SARS-CoV-2 viruses. Um, I will be showing you that different groups have decided to target different uh, uh, different parts of the genome. Some have gone for the nucleoprotein, others have gone for the matrix, others for the spike protein, and uh, some of these compare a little bit differently uh, in their detection levels, as well as the systems in which uh, whichever system you're dealing with, you must review and validate um, your tests against a number of others so that you know how it performs against different standards. If you look at the detailed uh, genome bits, you have the open reading frame A and B, and then you have the open reading frame 3A, and uh, your spike protein, you have your go to matrix protein, Uh, parts of these genomes, and some of them are working quite, quite with protection, not only based on the, and therefore, uh, the cutoff values or uh, analysis. Um, if China, for example, used, uh, or used the as the nucleoprotein. protein, uh, the, the, the French used two targets in the RDP, uh, the RDRP, uh, while the CDC, uh, uh, CDC targets um, different areas within uh, the nucleoprotein. protein. The Japan guys use the pan corona and multiple targets in the spike protein, while the, uh, the German protocol, which was adopted by WHO, uh, has three targets, both the RD, RP, as well as uh, targets in the E and or the envelope and the nuclear protein. Uh, the Hong Kong guys also target the ORF and the nuclear uh, protein, as well as the uh, nuclear protein as well. Um, why the Thailand guys only uh, specifically go for the nuclear protein. You will notice that actually most of the tests go for the nuclear protein, um, and that seems to have, um, uh, have um, been a little bit more uh, specific for the SARS-CoV-2, uh, but others have also found that uh, you need to add uh, different elements uh, to be able to confirm Which, uh, is, is, um, is, um, we know that uh, they, uh, they have three uh, targets. Uh, we've, we've been having several different questions about why should we, uh, why do different tests, why do different tests target different parts of the same protein? And uh, for example, uh, the N1 targets the virus. Capsid, capsid, as well as the, the RNA gene from the human nucleic acids. And this is normally a control to assess the sample integrity. Uh, the sample integrity is quite, quite important because you want to be sure that what you are processing further down the line actually contains nucleic acid material for the virus. And we use uh, the RNA's uh, P protein or primaries to be able to assess the sample integrity. There are different uh, protocols for assessment of sample integrities, uh, but uh, for this particular purpose in the CDC protocol, uh, the RP is used. Now, the, you must always, of course, use the uh, positive control, as I mentioned, and the CDC uses a non uh, virus that um, uh, they have included. Um, 
a negative control that just contains uh, nucleus free water to ensure that um, there is no contamination across uh, your asset. Uh, again, uh, this is a little bit of a crowded slide, but just to show you some of these uh, we have been talking about, you have uh, the different targets here for the Chinese uh, CDC, uh, but they also show you the different sensitivities for the, these different, uh, different tests. Now, this is very critical, as I mentioned, that the different platforms or different targets or different tests are going to give you uh, results basing on um, uh, what their sensitivities are, uh, probably much less of the specificity because we expect that uh, all these tests should be specific to SARS-CoV-2. So the major challenge is uh, the sensitivity or how much are they able to to detect. And, um, and uh, you can see that French is up to um, a level of detection. Of, um, the CDC is uh, up to uh, 500 copies, uh, while the Japan is also about 500 copies, and the German is about um, uh, 3.8 uh, copies. So the, uh, the sensitivity of the kind of test that we use is very, very critical. And uh, I will not go into the other platforms, but just go to again show you um, tests that are currently being used in terms of uh, specificity, so in terms of sensitivity. So for example, uh, in a study done by Zen in 2020, they used the expert, which was found to be more sensitive uh, with the level of detection uh, up to 100 copies and they were able to detect 100%. The EPLEX up to 1,000 copies, but the EID now is. Um, and so these variations of these tests are very, very critical. And um, this is why different countries are now uh, working towards developing uh, harmonized uh, testing algorithms to make sure that they can be able to provide um, uh, an algorithm that is going to take care of all these different levels of sensitivity. Finally, uh, you need, when, while setting up these um, labs, you need to take into consideration a couple of things. You need to look at the testing capabilities, how much samples are you going to be able to handle. You must put into consideration the infrastructure, the financial resources, the human qualifications, as well as the type of clientele that you are going to be dealing with. My apologies, uh, I took a little bit long, but it's very important that we evaluate this. And this has been a subject that has been uh, uh, quite controversial, particularly as the, the, the pandemic and the numbers of, um, and uh, if there are any questions, we'll be able to uh, discuss. Kirian, over to you. Uh, hi, Denis. Uh, thank you so very much indeed. Uh, I think uh, you, you went right to the crux of the matter as it is. Um, this is a really big conversation today for all of us in the clinical space, uh, just trying to understand what is happening and what the flow is. And that's why uh, I began with this introduction about trying to understand the people who should be in the testing area and uh, you actually hit the nail right in the middle of the head as you discussed the three major areas, uh, talking about uh, the reagent prep area, 
looking about spacement area and then looking at the, about, uh, the amplification areas. I think that was really, really important. But I think also uh, very important is actually looking at what is actually going on out there in terms of the different test methodologies uh, that and the different platforms that are out there and what the different nations are doing to be able to do testing. I think we're basically, uh, without saying it, I think what you actually uh, are taking us towards is for all countries around the world that are using multiple platform, uh, there really needs to be a very clear algorithm for how we test so that as the sensitivities for the test uh, differ from one platform to the next, uh, depending on what algorithm uh, or what testing platforms different countries have, we truly need to come up with a very clear algorithm to be able to say, yes, if you test negative in one place and you really are, are symptomatic, uh, what should happen? What's the next platform that should be used uh, for testing you to be able to be sure uh, that you are not showing up with one of the other flus, uh, but you actually are showing up with SARS-CoV-2? Uh, that's very important. And I think that's something that uh, needs to be looked into as we go on. Uh, this is one of the few times that we've actually run over, uh, but I thank you so very much indeed. I noticed uh, that everybody stayed very put. I think uh, this is a subject that seems to attract a lot of attention. Uh, we're going to consider giving it another rerun at some other time, but looking at it again from a completely different angle, again, associating it with standards, that's what we do at the Global Healthcare Public Foundation, uh, as we accentuate the need for standards in all different uh, areas of uh, practice and organizations. So we'll be looking at this again, uh, not too long from now, but looking at another angle and another area of testing and uh, what we should do in our clinical laboratories, public health laboratories, Diagnostic of forensic laboratories to ensure the reliability of our results. At this point, I'm going to break for just a few minutes. Uh, if anybody has a question, comment uh, for Dennis or myself, we'll be very glad uh, to take that at this time. I think there is one that came in already in the chat. Uh, thank you for the impressive uh, presentation. I genuinely believe all clinical laboratories undoubtedly require the sufficient resources to set up. Do you genuinely have any practical ways how one can positively receive local support from potential partners in a possible case when someone has good business plan and eagerly wants to typically start up a clinical laboratory? Uh, that's a good one. Dennis, I'm not sure whether you know how we can get some money for this, uh, but I'll just tell you, uh, this is a great time to be able to look into this direction. This is a great time. Uh, there is so much funding all over the world uh, right now. Uh, Global Fund will not give money to an individual. They'll give money to a government. So if you partner with the ministries of health in the countries in which you are in, and you have a substantial uh, business plan, you have a clear uh, clinical chain that you're working with, I'm sure you could certainly get money out of that. Uh, again, uh, there are a lot of uh, the Centers for Disease Control uh, there are a, a lot of uh, partners around the globe. Uh, there is Resolve for Life, to save life. There are lots of different outfits in the world that are going to be very willing uh, to partner with a good business plan, a strong uh, clinical history uh, to be able to support something in this vein. Uh, Dennis, I don't know if you know something else that you might want to share. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Kirian. I think this is uh, an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure if there are direct uh, support or there is direct support for this, but as you mentioned, there are quite a number of partners that would be interested, particularly for those that have already started up and they are looking for further support uh, to set up these kinds of diagnostic uh, uh, for, for these diseases. But uh, also um, the, the manufacturers like to uh, what they call equipment placement. If you have a facility and you're already running and you're looking at uh, setting up some of the platforms, some of the equipment manufacturers will be very happy to give you an equipment and you only have to procure supplies. So that's the easiest, uh, basing on uh, what we have seen. And if you already have the basic infrastructure, that would be much, much easier. Thank you, Kirian. Thank you, thank you. Uh, any more? Any more questions, uh, comments? Just unmute if you have something to say, just unmute and uh, start speaking or raise your hand up and we could call you. Um.
otherwise uh, i just uh, i never like to uh, come to this point of this presentation without uh, trying to remind everybody uh, that the sars cov2 virus is real covid19 as we've come to know it uh, please uh, make sure that you look into your temperatures ascertain what your temperature body temperature levels are uh, continue to wash your hands wash your hands as many times as you possibly can running water and soap is excellent uh, if you don't have access to that uh, that's okay uh, use a good uh, sanitizer and always always please let's wear a face wear uh, let's have a good face wear on that can protect uh, any possibility of any particles flying away from either ourselves to other people or from other people to ourselves uh, it's very important I think one of the greatest challenges that we have today is compliance to uh, these very four simple uh, requests that all the ministries of health and every responsible person is making today. Please wash your hands, please sanitize, please wear a face mask as often as you possibly can. And let's continue to have some very good social distancing uh, between ourselves and everybody else in our space. Uh, this is going to be able to help us uh, fight uh, the COVID-19 and it's going to lead us to great places. Again, you can contact us at uh, info at globalhf.org, or you could give us a call if you're in the Uganda area. Join us on Facebook. You could see this in 24 hours from now. You could see a rerun. Uh, check us on our website. Uh, but once again, I just want to say thank you so much indeed for joining us today. I uh, will see you same time, same place next week, Monday. It's always a pleasure. Have a wonderful week and see you soon. <laughs>